little ready to start our uh, no, regular meeting, regular seminar of United for Ukraine Network. My name is Andrew Skupilius. I am from Lithuania, member of the parliament since 2018. Before that, in Lithuania, I was in politics, I don't remember, from for ages, you know, <laughs> including uh, prime minister of Lithuania. And, uh, well, today we have really a uh, very good uh, uh, occasion uh, to move into uh, some very important issues, which uh, we started to discuss in our network uh, immediately uh, when the network was created uh, uh, at the very beginning of the war. Uh, so the topic is about reconstruction of uh, Ukraine, so-called uh, Marshall Plan, or somebody saying we cannot call it, we should call Brussels or whatever plan, you know. But in general, we understand uh, what a huge uh, task is ahead of us. Uh, I came just uh, recently, last week, we we came back from Kiev. We had, I was with uh, United for Ukraine delegation, then with EPP delegation also in Kiev, but also I visited Chernigov, which if you know geography of Ukraine is north-west, I would call, on the border with Belarus and Russia, and, and that was the region, not the city, but the region which was um, occupied by Russian military at the very beginning. And when you see destruction, you know, in, in that region and in Chernigov itself, you understand uh, what, uh, what, what, what challenge, what task, uh, where communities now are trying to rebuild, private people also are rebuilding their, their houses, you know, their apartment houses, they want to live in their in their houses, and, and then you see really what's, how all the reconstruction uh, idea, what's, what is the, is the importance of that for daily life of people, and of course for the whole future of Ukraine, and uh, for the whole future also of uh, the whole European Union. Uh, so definitely, um, uh, I will not repeat uh, all those numbers, which uh, more or less we know, you know, 750 billion or 1 trillion, uh, the whole, you know, the whole uh, evaluation of the damages which were done. Uh, we shall not perhaps go now from where those money can come, what to do with Russian provision assets. That is a topic for, for, uh, for our next seminars, but it's very good that as we understood from our visit to uh, Kiev and also what we know from uh, recent developments uh, here in 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 Brussels in EU institutions, uh, there are some steps forward, uh, you know, especially with institutional arrangement, uh, and that is really for us uh, very good opportunity, you know, to start our more concrete, you know, discussion. Not only about the big tasks, you know, and and what is how important is that, you know, reconstruction, but also to start very concrete discussion about. Uh, about uh, the first steps in in, uh, in institutional building of uh, which will be very important for realization of that project, and of course the questions are very clear: how the whole project should be implemented in such a way that trust of the people would be you know guaranteed for the whole process of implementation, and that is what uh, civil society is asking, you know, regional authorities are asking. That's very important. I remember my own uh, engagement with, uh, even before the war, uh, we had some kind of this idea to have Marshall Plan for Ukraine, you know, we were promoting back in from 2017, that, you know, there is a need of big investment money to come into Ukraine. Well, we learned a lot. What are the problems? Not money, but uh, absorption capacity was a problem. But also I, I you know, uh, I remember my my you know curiosity to read about uh, let's say original Marshall Plan, the history of Marshall Plan, you know, or how it was, you know, why it was established, how it was established, and what were the major challenges for American you know authorities back at that time. So I would say that you know Americans had very clear plan and very clear understanding how important it is to keep you know people's trust in the in the whole project both on the American side and also on the European side. So that was some kind of priority, you know, in implementation of the whole, of the whole project. So 
without uh, longer uh, introduction, really, I am very, very, very happy, very glad that today we have, uh, you know, possibility the first time in our in our network in our community uh, to start discussion of that uh, topic in a very concrete way, and we have honor and privilege to have with us uh, Gabriel Blank uh, from Digineer uh, European Commission and uh, who is uh, leading uh, uh, the newly established uh, Ukraine service uh, and the multi-agency do donor coordination platform, as I understand, quite a complicated uh, <laughs> title, but nevertheless. So it's the first institutional arrangement on, our, on the US side. And, and uh, perhaps uh, Katrina explain, you know, at first we shall have several presentations, then we shall move into Q&A, some, some interventions from the audience, but now, yeah. So please, Director, go on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kubilius. And uh, thanks to all for attending this, uh, this event and for inviting the European Commission to uh, participate. So my name is Gabriel Blanc. I'm the uh, acting head of unit of one of the units recently uh, created uh, in Digineer to deal with Ukraine. I will say a bit uh, more about that uh, in a minute. Uh, but because of uh, today, today is the 8th of March, uh, and that's the day of fight for women's equal rights over the world. I just wanted to start by acknowledging uh, the, that the women in Ukraine are paying a very uh, high price for in this uh, very unjust uh, war. And in particular, I wanted to pay tribute to Ukrainian women engaged uh, on the front lines and beyond as medics for logistical support, but also in governmental positions and uh, in the civil society. Uh, to pay tri tribute to Ukrainian women that had to leave uh, their country uh, because of the uh, the situation and leave uh, sometimes with children to seek for protection uh, in the EU. And to pay tribute to Ukrainian women the, who were a victim of the barbarian use of rape as a weapon of uh, uh, by Russian uh, soldiers. This is, uh, 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 I wanted to start with it, and uh, I think this is also important to already uh, think now uh, about the role of uh, women uh, in uh, Ukraine tomorrow and uh, how we should consider uh, supporting Ukraine so that women and children uh, that had to leave the country uh, will come back to the country. Uh, in this respect, uh, the EU is providing uh, uh, support to uh, many different uh, Ukrainian civil society organizations that are working on these issues and supporting women uh, in the EU and in Ukraine. Uh, I also wanted to, to say a word, uh, and because of the, the framework of this event, uh, and uh, on the civil society uh, involvement, which is uh, uh, for us crucial across the board. Uh, I think it's in all our strategic documents, it's there. We believe that the role uh, of the CSOs will be uh, crucial in the reconstruction. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, we have acknowledged uh, uh, for a long time in the Commission, is the very critical role that uh, Ukrainian civil society uh, plays uh, in, U in the Ukrainian society. And uh, uh, on uh, different uh, uh, dimensions, would it be uh, with their engagement with the government, uh, with the expertise that they are providing, uh, and then, uh, of course, knowledge and implementation capacity on the ground. Uh, over these years, we have provided an unwavering support to Ukrainian uh, civil society organizations across sectors and across uh, regions uh, in Ukraine. And uh, we have repurposed uh, our assistance to the civil society uh, in Ukraine to make sure that it makes sense uh, in today's circumstances of war. We have also a, a dialogue well established with civil society organizations uh, in Ukraine uh, in different uh, topics, uh, sectors. And uh, uh, in particular, we have uh, recently launched uh, an informal dialogue uh, with Valeria, whom I uh, thank, who is coordinating that on the uh, Ukraine CSO side. Uh, so we have a forum for discussion on reconstruction-related uh, uh, issues. So this is uh, uh, appreciated, and I hope we will have the next one soon. In relation to, uh, to it, uh, I wanted just to say a couple of words uh, on uh, build back better, which is one of the uh, mantra for the, the reconstruction, and on the fact that uh, obviously we see the uh, uh, candidate status and the whole accession uh, path of Ukraine 
and the reconstruction of the country as mutually reinforcing, reinforcing and so that's uh, uh, very uh, uh, important to include always the dimension of uh, the accession process when we speak about the reconstruction. Because indeed, building back better, that means about building back in line with EU standards, building by, back based on the European Green Deal principles, and supporting the digital transformation of the country. This is about the green energy transition. This is about circularity of the economy and about sustainability of the investments that will be made in the country. Uh, what, what we, we see uh, today is uh, with the massive strikes uh, from Russia on the energy system is that it pushes as well uh, transformation of the whole energy system in Ukraine to have it more distributed, to increase the role of renewable energy, reduce the dependency towards fossil fuels. And this is, uh, of course, a movement that we are very keen to, uh, uh, to support. Uh, there were uh, first uh, examples of, uh, this is um, maybe a, a only an example, but just to illustrate that uh, we have started to uh, uh, think even in the period of uh, high urgency on how we can do that. So recently there were uh, uh, announcement on uh, the EU providing 5,700 solar panels to Ukraine to combine them with uh, uh, batteries and uh, uh, diesel generators and uh, to, uh, uh, to reply to uh, uh, emergency needs uh, in terms of energy. This is also about providing uh, energy efficient uh, uh, light bulbs uh, 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 to Ukraine. 30 million have been provided. That's uh, about the capacity of uh, one block of uh, uh, nuclear uh, power plants and other initiatives that are already coming now in this critical period. Uh, I wanted on Build Back Better to add also a dimension that I believe is very important is the uh, socially inclusive reconstruction uh, because of course uh, this is uh, essential to include uh, in the Build Back Better uh, the reconstruction of the society that will have to heal from the traumas of the war. In this, uh, since the, 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 the bit more than one year since the, the full-scale war started, uh, on the EU side, uh, as you all know, uh, I'm sure we have been uh, focusing our support uh, to ensure that we reply to uh, the emergency situation. So from the Commission, we have been dealing with how we can be mobilized uh, to provide relief to the population, uh, in particular during the winter. So that was uh, about uh, uh, providing shelters, uh, equipment to repair the grid, about uh, uh, generators, about the uh, urgent rehabilitation uh, of buildings, and also on uh, uh, the support that we have provided uh, to ensure that the state budget remains afloat. So that's the macro financial assistance that is uh, 18 billion for 2023 and where disbursements uh, are ongoing. Uh, this is a reply to the uh, short-term emergency needs uh, of the country. Uh, but we are also working for the longer term with uh, these twin objectives that I already mentioned, accession and reconstruction. And to do that, uh, we have a, a new uh, administrative structure uh, that, that I want to, to describe to, to you in the Commission uh, to be up to the challenge. So this is a new directorate uh, that is called Ukraine Service that has been uh, established uh, in, uh, in January uh, this year on the basis of the uh, previous support group for Ukraine that was established after the Revolution of Dignity in 2014. And this is a, an upgrade of this task force uh, that becomes a fully-fledged directorate of the European Commission. The, this directorate will serve as the entry point for all Ukraine-related matters in the Commission. It is made of three units. The first unit that will deal, uh, is actually already dealing with policy coordination and reconstruction. That's the unit that I'm currently uh, uh, heading. The second unit, the unit that will deal with uh, economic reforms and sectoral policies, everything related to structural reforms, to uh, social policies and to all sectoral uh, areas pertaining to the Green Deal will be covered by this unit. And the third unit uh, that will deal with fundamentals, rule of law, anti-fraud, justice and uh, internal control. We uh, are currently staffing this directorate uh, on, in addition to uh, commission staff, 
uh, there will be uh, uh, secondaries from EU member states that are interested to uh, be part uh, of this directorate. This is the, the place, the directorate uh, uh, of uh, DigiNear, uh, which is uh, so Ukraine service, where we will deal with the, the design and implementation of uh, the uh, instrument for Ukraine's reconstruction and uh, uh, coordinate the EU accession process on the Commission side. Now, uh, turning to uh, another uh, um, uh, development uh, which uh, uh, I wanted to, to, to mention, this relates to the multi-agency donor coordination platform. This multi-agency uh, donor coordination platform uh, saw its uh, inaugural steering committee meeting uh, at the end of January. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the, the platform's mandate. It's about coordination of the support for Ukraine's uh, immediate financing needs and future economic recovery and uh, reconstruction across different sources. This is a donor coordination mechanism. The uh, platform will not pool resources and do not uh, has not been established uh, for joint operations. This is established as a donor coordination mechanism to make sure that what all the partners of Ukraine are providing as a support makes sense as a whole, and also uh, to ease the work of the Ukrainian authorities when addressing uh, the uh, partners uh, that as a, um, a first point of entry to access all the main donors of Ukraine at the same time. Uh, in this platform, uh, you have uh, 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 the G7 uh, uh, countries are represented, uh, and uh, uh, IFI's uh, international financing institutions are participating uh, to the, the steering committee uh, of the meeting. There is a, a three. Uh, there are three co-chairs: uh, the EU, Ukraine, and uh, the US. Uh, so there will be a regular meeting of the steering committee of the platform. Uh, the next one is foreseen by the end of March. With this, uh, uh, the platform is equipped with a, a secretariat. Uh, that will support the work of the steering committee. The secretariat is hosted by the European Commission uh, with an office here in Brussels and another one in Kiev that will be hosted by the government of Ukraine. Uh, the secretariat has an administrative role. It does not have an executive mandate and its purpose is to provide administrative assistance and coordination across the different uh, bodies of the platform in relation with the, its scope. We are also uh, regularly, from on the Commission side, we are regularly informing uh, the Council. There is a ad hoc uh, uh, working party uh, that has been established for the uh, Commission uh, to update uh, the, the Member States. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we'll do so with the European Parliament as well. Uh, voilà. I will stop here with my presentation. Thank well, you very much. Well, it was very interesting. You should continue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So, but yeah, here perhaps will be quite quite a lot of questions now. Really, it's my pleasure to move uh, to our next speaker with a lot of very important experience, uh, Hugo Mingarelli, the former EU ambassador to Ukraine, and also uh, uh, the person who was leading, uh, he was a director of the European Agency for the Reconstruction of the Balkans back in 1999, 2002. Now uh, he's a lecturer in international relations, but uh, really very much, you know, engaged still in Ukrainian issues. And we are very happy uh, to have always on our meetings uh, uh, Ambassador Mingarelli. And now I will give the floor exactly. So the question is very simple: What, uh, what, you know, experience from Balkan, Western Balkans? You should. Uh, uh, you know, point uh, exactly for that issue of how to keep, you know, the trust of society into all the projects, uh, big projects for reconstruction. <clears throat> Thanks very much for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, interesting debate. All people who have been dealing with Ukraine over the last uh, 30 years know that uh, the civil society organization of these countries have been playing a decisive role in the transformation of Ukraine. And this is uh, particularly true for the period between uh, 2014 and 2021, when the most important reforms which have uh, modernized the political and economic life of the country have uh, taken place. It is therefore uh, extremely important to ensure that uh, the uh, outstanding civil society of this country will be uh, fully involved in all dimensions 
of the recovery process. Uh, I hope that uh, all reconstruction partners, namely the Ukrainian authorities, the international organization, and the IFIs will uh, recognize, empower, and engage in the most possible inclusive way in uh, all dimensions of the recovery process with this uh, civil society activist. Uh, as I said, I consider that most dimension of the recovery process should be of interest for the CSO, but I will focus on four of them. First one, at the helm of the institutional architecture of this reconstruction process, we have the so-called donors coordination platform. This donors coordination platform should be in charge of the recovery plan, and this recovery plan should be grounded on three main pillars. The first one is a restoration of the damaged and destroyed uh, infrastructure and production facilities. The second one should be the uh, 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 restoration, the resumption of the reform process. And the third one is obviously the uh, accession negotiation uh, process. These three pillars are closely interrelated. You cannot move on one without taking into consideration what you have to do with the other two. When the recovery plan is established, you have to decide, this donor coordination platform will have to decide on, the, on a limited number of priority sectors to focus on each year. And I insist on that. If the uh, donor coordination platform and the main donors try to do everything at the same time, this would be a recipe for disaster. They have to choose every year a limited number of sectors to focus on. And here, the CSO, because they are on the ground and are the best able to apprehend, to assess, to judge the priority needs, should play a key role in every year the selection of the priority sectors. Second point, we know that although uh, the Russians have been shelling the whole territory of Ukraine, there are some parts of Ukraine we have been uh, 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 destroyed more than others. These are mainly the oblast of Sumy, Kharkiv, Lugansk, Donetsk, uh, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. And in order to select the priority geographic areas where each year we will have to focus on, we have again to rely on the civil society organization, because these people on the ground will be able to drive the whole international community on the priority geographic areas where we have to focus on. Second point, once uh, there is an agreement on the main element of the recovery plan, there is a need to select the individual project which will have to be funded each year. And here, obviously, uh, the main decision should be in the hands not of the Ukrainian government or the uh, international partner uh, sitting in Brussels or in uh, Washington, but in the hands of the local authorities, the business community, and the civil society organization. The selection of the project to be funded each year should be determined by those who are on the ground and know best the priority needs of the population. This is a second point. Third point, we know that many potential donors are uh, hesitating about uh, getting involved because of uh, the Ukraine reputation about corruption. And therefore, one of the first steps of this reconstruction project should be to establish a comprehensive monitoring mechanism. This monitoring mechanism should ensure transparency, accountability, and sound financial management. Transparency means that 
the civil society organization as well as the main funders should be able to access at any moment on a constant basis to three kinds of data. First of all, the state of implementation of every single project. Where do we stand on the project cycle at any moment? Second point, where do we stand in the commitment and disbursement of the funds earmarked for each single project? Third point, in which way and to whom have been awarded the contracts in the implementation of the various project? Many Ukrainian NGOs have already insisted on the fact that the access on open data will be a key to the success or the failure of the reconstruction process. I must insist on that. All CSU, CSO must have constant access to open data. And in this regard, you may remember that when the Marshall Law was introduced at the beginning of last year, just a few weeks after the start of the uh, Russian full-scale invasion, uh, the Ukrainian authorities restricted access to some open data. And this has to be changed. For instance, there is a business register. I think that the exact name is the Unified State Register, on which the CSO in Ukraine were working in their uh, investigation for anti-corruption. This register is no longer uh, uh, open to a CSO. We should insist with the international community so that the CSO can again get access to this. Another point in this regard, uh, many uh, international partners have already said that the digital reconstruction management system that some uh, civil society organizations have presented at the Ministry of Infrastructure at the beginning of last year should be a key element of the monitoring system. I fully share this view. So uh, I insist on that the monitoring mechanism should be set up not in six months time, in 12 months time. It should already be up and running. It is not, but the international partner should work on this immediately. My last point, uh, we know that uh, in some areas, especially in the eastern part and the southern part of Ukraine, the population have been under a constant shelling by Russia, not uh, over the last 12 months, but over the last nine years. And it's clear that this, a large part of these people are traumatized. This is why the reconstruction uh, and the recovery plan should have a specific approach to this region, which have been occupied by the Russian forces. We should, first of all, shape specific project to help the population who have been traumatized by the shelling and by the occupation of their territories over the last nine years. And the CSO should be the driver, driving forces of this project because they know these people and they know under which circumstances they have been living for nine years. Second point, in all these areas which have been uh, occupied either for nine years, like in uh, Lugansk in Donetsk Oblast, or for a few months, like in the uh, Kherson Oblast, a number of Ukrainians have been uh, fighting against the uh, uh, aggressor, but we know as well that some Ukrainians have been collaborating with uh, uh, the uh, uh, Russians. And it will be necessary under the recovery process to reconcile the population in these uh, large areas of Ukraine. And here again, we need specific projects which have to be drawn and implemented by the civil society activists who know exactly these people and who know why they behaved in some way during these strategic circumstances. To conclude, I have to say as well that when it comes to the 
reform process and the uh, negotiation accession, uh, accession negotiation, which are two other pillars of the recovery exercise, the CSO are in Ukraine probably the most competent uh, uh, actors. You may remember, for instance, that when we have been implementing the DCFTA under the association agreement, we had with us uh, some uh, civil society activists who were informing us about the progress made, the difficulties encountered, and the steps which had to be taken to overcome the difficulties. Today, when we try to assess the progress made on the seven preconditions set by the Council to start the accession negotiation, Again, we have a, a number of a CSO in Ukraine who are able to tell us up to now between 60 and 70 percent of the seven conditions have been met. So as soon as the accession negotiations start, there is no doubt that on most of the 33 chapters that we will have to cover and in which our Ukrainian friends will have to take over the acquis communautaire, the civil society organization will be extremely well placed to guide the national authorities in Ukraine and to inform us, the international partners, on the obstacles and what we have to do to overcome them. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot, Ambassador. Really, as always, your experience is, is very valuable. Now we're moving to a civil society uh, side, uh, which were initiated of this uh, uh, form of this seminar. So I'm very happy to give the floor to Natalia Andrusevich, Resource and Analysis Center, Society and Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kubilius. Um, dear uh, colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, here and uh, thanks a lot for your interest, is, uh, interest in uh, this uh, topic and also uh, thanks all uh, Europeans for your support of uh, Ukraine and uh, Ukrainian uh, people. And uh, today we are talking about um, reconstruction and recovery of Ukraine and participation in this process of uh, civil society. And uh, now uh, Ukraine and uh, our international uh, partners have, uh, have started uh, discussing the agenda and a plan for the future post-war recovery of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, by a launch of uh, different uh, initiatives at uh, international, national, and even a local uh, level. Uh, civil society uh, in Ukraine uh, is uh, traditionally very active, and uh, Mr. Blank and Mr. Mingarelli already mentioned about uh, the significant impact of uh, Ukrainian civil society on reforming the country, on monitoring the association uh, agreement, uh, so, so on. And uh, now uh, civil society organizations uh, try to be uh, full participants in the processes related to recovery and reconstruction of uh, Ukraine, uh, both uh, from, from the very beginning of, of this process, uh, both um, through um, initiative, uh, participating in the initiatives uh, launched by other stakeholders like state bodies and international organizations uh, and also by uh, by launching uh, their own uh, initiatives at international and national level uh, unfortunately civil society has uh, limited access to some of these uh, processes um, Civil society groups have to make uh, some efforts to uh, gain access uh, to agenda setting and uh, participating in uh, different uh, processes. Uh, also, uh, the martial uh, law um, have a negative impact on the public participation, especially in the field of uh, environment and uh, climate change. Uh, I'm talking about such traditional uh, public participation participation mechanisms as uh, environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental uh, assessment. Uh, so uh, before the event, we prepared uh, the research uh, on 
involvement of civil society in different processes and uh, uh, defined some uh, barriers to such participation and also propose some recommendations. And on your tables, you have the um, executive summary of, uh, of this uh, report and using the QR code, you can uh, have access to the full uh, analytical report, each, which is uh, available both in Ukrainian and uh, English. Uh, so uh, going back to the involvement of civil society, as I said, we um, revealed a number of, um, of barriers to public participation in the reconstruction and recovery uh, processes, and uh, they include, so first, a lack of transparency of the process uh, during uh, creation and uh, participation in uh, different uh, initiatives, both at uh, uh, national level in Ukraine and also in international level. For example, when we are talking about Ukraine, its participation in the work of uh, National uh, Council uh, for recovery of Ukraine, when we are talking about international processes, its participation of civil society in different conferences at international level. Uh, so the next one is insufficient awareness and timelines of providing information about uh, recovery to civil society. Uh, so uh, now um, the reconstruction process uh, is taking place at different levels. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different uh, initiatives and sometimes they look as a parallel very similar initiatives and so um, tracking uh, all this array of events projects uh, draft documents uh, sometimes doesn't help uh, so um, it's a uh, so it's very connected to the next barrier. It's lack of a single platform where you can uh, find all this in, uh, information and uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which is accessible for civil society. Uh, also. Um, uh, it is appropriate to uh, involve civil society. Um, at the la la late stages of reconstructions, not from the beginning, and give the civil society uh, only the role of observer or watchdog of, of the process. So it's very important to involve civil society from the beginning of the project, uh, of, the, of the process of reconstruction, as well as to uh, involve uh, local civil society organizations and as well as local authorities. Uh, so the next one is insufficient consideration of the opinion of regular citizens of Ukraine when defining and shaping uh, reforms, in particular related to reconstruction of uh, Ukraine. Uh, so what uh, can help be helped uh, here, uh, there are two, two ways. One, to involve more groups different of different civil society stakeholders, which represent different categories of uh, citizens, uh, or to take into account the um, public opinion uh, opinion uh, polls um, in order to, to know what uh, what people want uh, to see in the reconstruction process uh, so uh, also we um, in our um, research paper, we propose a number of um, recommendations, so how to improve the situation and to increase the public participation in the processes of recovery and reconstruction. So uh, the first one is to uh, establish clear frameworks for transparency and participation in the process of planning and implementation of uh, post-war reconstruction. Uh, so it is very important that um, state uh, authorities and uh, international organizations have a very clear vision and clear procedures how they involve civil society uh, organizations. So it uh, will help to uh, have this uh, process uh, transparent and to involve uh, all um, stakeholders into into the pro into the process. However, there is no need to over formalize the process. 
um, in uh, order not to have uh, such situation when you have the process but no real participation. Uh, in addition to the to the general framework of involvement of civil society, uh, also it's very important to use a sectoral uh, sectoral approach uh, for public participation. Uh, for example, in the field of uh, environment and uh, climate change, because each sector has its own specifics. Uh, public participation uh, at this. Uh, process of planning of reconstruction and reconstruction uh, itself uh, can be a guarantee of the successful participation of civil society organizations in the process of accession um, of uh, Ukraine uh, to the European uh, Union. So civil society organization can help uh, uh, to the government uh, to raise uh, uh, awareness of population, to do some capacity building activities, uh, monitor the process and prepare uh, shadow reports, for example. Uh, also, we recommend to uh, establish uh, interaction and dialogue in a triangle Ukraine, international partners and civil society. So there is no need to have the parallel processes when interact uh, Ukrainian civil society and the government, Ukrainian civil society, international partners. So it's much more um, effective and better to have this in the close uh, cooperation. Uh, so uh, the next one is uh, creation of um, digital post-war recovery uh, platform uh, where um, we can put all uh, information about uh, different initiatives uh, on recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine, all draft documents, all uh, stakeholders, and uh, in the future, uh, it also can be used to monitor the financial flows, financial resources which uh, uh, Ukraine take for recovery and uh, reconstruction. Uh, <clears throat> the next one uh, is about international partners. So international partners must uh, demonstrate leadership and uh, good faith in ensuring the principles of good governance, including public participation. Uh, so it's uh, important that international uh, partners, governmental and non-governmental, should uh, avoid uh, elitism, bias, and selectivity in the involvement of civil society uh, organizations, and also um, as I already mentioned, it's very important to involve uh, not uh, only like big coalitions, but also uh, local civil society organizations and uh, local authorities to the processes. Um, it's uh, also um, a time to uh, determine the principles of public participation and public control uh, during the implementation of the uh, plan for the post recovery of Ukraine from the consequences of the war. Uh, it is important uh, mostly for environmental non-governmental organization and it will be extremely useful to have such a um, road map how to use uh, uh, public participation tools and access to environmental uh, information uh, during the law, during the, uh, during the martial law, during the war, and also uh, for the post-war um, reconstruction. Uh, so the next one is um, that uh, state uh, bodies and international partners uh, should uh, perceive a civil society organization as uh, partners. Uh, so it's uh, important. It's not like not like in the environmental impact assessment. So it's a rather di different uh, approach it can be used. So there is no uh, proponent or contractor. So uh, they should be um, like. Um, uh, like partners in the process, so everybody can bring its idea, and uh, it's not appropriate to involve civil society only as uh, observers in the process or only for commenting documents, so everybody is equal in the process. Uh, 
Also, it's uh, very important to take into account the synergy uh, of, the, of the process uh, of uh, green recovery of Ukraine and future membership in the European Union. Uh, so the opening of uh, negotiations uh, for a green cluster, uh, including environment, climate change, uh, energy, uh, will help uh, to ensure that uh, the recovery of Ukraine takes place on the principles uh, not only uh, build back better, but also build back uh, greener, helping to ensure to ensure decarbonization, climate neutrality. Uh, sustainability principles during the reconstruction of Ukraine. So I'll stop here, and if any questions, I'll be happy. Okay, Thank good. You. And we have the last uh, presentation from Valeria Izek, uh, who is an expert from Bankwatch and who will speak about the best practices and lessons learned on, on the civil society involvement in donor coordination platforms. So please go on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and happy International Women's Day. Um, thank you, Gabriel, for um, drawing attention to the sufferings of Ukrainian women and to the role of Ukrainian women. But I would also like to express our solidarity with Georgian people today. I think that today a photo of Georgian woman facing down a wall of police and water cannon armed with nothing than courage and flag got global. And for us Ukrainians, it's uh, like a flash, flashback into 2014 when the revolution of dignity started. And as Ukrainian soldiers die now for merrily saying Slava Ukraini, our battle for democratic rights and values continues, including today and this table. On the diplomatic front, there are three key battles that I believe we need to discuss today in Brussels. Firstly, it's open accession negotiations for Ukraine. Secondly, an EU regulation rebuild Ukraine facility. And thirdly, involving Ukrainian civil society organizations in the donor coordination platform. So opening accession negotiations for Ukraine means we will have safeguarding measures for the disbursements of money which are already shuttled by the end of 2023. Although we always hear in the political uh, sphere that um, we talk about post-war Ukraine reconstruction, in reality, some early reconstruction projects have already started. To give you an example, 18 apartment buildings in Kyiv region will be rebuilt by the end of 2023. Um, so that 4,000 people can return home. Zhitome region will receive 30 million euro for reconstruction from Estonia and funds will be dispersed in three years starting this year. And a French quarter will be rebuilt in the village of Vorzel, Kyiv region. So this is just to illustrate that early sporadic reconstruction efforts are unfolding in Ukraine, which is good news. But at the same time, we're puzzled about the latest developments in financing these first reconstruction efforts. On February 10, the Ukrainian government approved the procedure for using 52.5 billion hryvnias from the Armed Aggression Consequences Liquidation Fund. And to point out a few risks in this decree, there is no explanation for why one reconstruction project is prioritized over another. So heads of the regional military administrations will have carte blanche in identifying reconstruction sites and in their regions. Second, it also fails to mention a single word about transparency and public access to information, the obligation to publish minutes and decisions of the commissions. And finally, the decree doesn't exactly inspire confidence that spending will be aligned with the green transition. So there is no mention of building standards, energy efficiency principles, and so on and so forth. So our colleagues from the Institute of Legislative Initiatives who deeply analyze this decree are working with the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine to reverse the potential damage that this decree can cause. 
But now I invite you to imagine the EU opening accession negotiations for Ukraine, prioritizing the green transition. Uh, some politicians claim that Ukraine was only granted status because of Russia's full-scale war on Ukraine, while other EU officials like, for instance, Katerina Maternova, provide arguments to conclude that Ukraine can defend itself against Russian occupiers and implement some essential reforms simultaneously. We have seen that particularly in the last year with Ukraine radically accelerating its reform programs to meet EU requirements. I want to emphasize here, it doesn't mean that Ukraine will become a member state next year or in two years. No, we are very well aware about the technical dialogue. It implies the capacity of our civil servants and institutions to observe the EU acquis and especially the unanimous agreement of 27 member states. But we are talking here about open accession negotiations to align the reconstruction process with the accession process. So again, I'd like to emphasize here that our goal is to use accession negotiations as safeguarding measures and an overarching framework to kickstart the first reconstruction disbursements. And now on, on to my second point, which is the EU regulation on rebuilt Ukraine facility. In May 2022, the European Commission committed to establish this financial instrument. This was very much welcomed as a great step forward in financing the reconstruction effort. Bankwatch analyzed the implementation of EU cohesion policy funds and the reconstruction and recovery facility, res resilience and recovery facility to understand how to best amplify its success in Central and Eastern European countries for the Rebuild Ukraine facility. One of our main takeaways from this research was the critical importance of the European Code of Conduct on Partnership. This is an instrument of involvement of the civil society and municipalities, socioeconomic actors. And what is important, it's legally binding. So it's attached to the common revision regulation and mandatory for all the, Euro uh, the European member states. Uh, the, code, the code of conduct defines how governments and managing authorities must engage with stakeholders in the preparation, implementation, and monitoring of the programs. This is another safeguard that can be included in the EU regulation on Ukraine facility and bring the decree in line with our values of democratic involvement of civil society. Finally, the donor coordination platform. While the structure of the financing platform is still under development, even after the first kickoff meeting, and as Gabriel mentioned, the Secretariat is at the outset of its work, it will be essential to ensure that there are mechanisms that set common rules and standards for stakeholders' engagement. So, so far, we had the public uh, discussion with uh, Katarina Maternova, who also mentioned that civil society engagement is envisioned in this donor coordination platform, but it's very difficult to define the structure behind inclusion of the civil society. For one simple reason, um, every G7 country and the European Commission is represented by one person, while when we talk about civil society, it cannot be represented by one person. That's, that's the main challenge, and we need to really investigate into how, how, to, how to ensure that if it's one person or two people, they speak for, for entire civil society, which, is, which, is, uh, which sounds very, um, very challenging for us. So now we investigate UNEP's Stakeholder Engagement Handbook, which provides some suggestions how we can do that. But preliminary, we have some ideas, which is at least to have two representatives, one from a Build Back Better coalition and one from the transparency and accountability bubble. And it's essential that we're not observers, but a part of a decision-making process. 
So I will stop here and I hope that this will give some food for thoughts to our colleagues who are connected online and who are here with us today. And we look forward to hearing their suggestions. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So those were your presentations uh, which were planned in advance. Uh, really very interesting uh, points, very interesting uh, uh, topic and uh, quite a lot of <laughs> questions immediately or not. Uh, now we shall move to questions and answers, so please uh, use uh, chat uh, you know, for those who are online. Here you can raise a hand in advance you know, if you want to, to ask the question. And I will ask, uh, you know, I will use my <laughs> power of, of, you know, of keeping you. microphone, yeah, uh, no, uh, I will ask maybe the first question and maybe to, to Mr. Gabriel. Uh, so, uh, really, you know, you, you know everything about uh, how things should be uh, done, should be established. And uh, uh, while listening, you know, all the different opinions, uh, really we can uh, see what, what a complex issue, what a complex problem, and, and how to keep the trust of the people really is one of those, you know, biggest challenges how to involve the, you know, civil society organizations and so on and so on. But, uh, you know, I can imagine what, uh, what the challenge is for Prime Minister of Ukraine, you know. I was at some time Prime Minister and I know that at the end, you know, with all those complexities you need to, to structureize your own vision, what, what you will do, you know. So my first question would be very simple. Uh, can uh, can you explain a little bit of calendar? When what kind of decisions will be made, both on on EU side, on donor side, and on Ukrainian side? When the institution should be established? When the you know what uh, Ambassador Mingarelli was calling you know uh, recovery plan should start to be discussed? So that is in some way you know for us to understand where the whole picture you know how things can can go on and what. What should be decided during the war? What should be, I don't know if, if anything will be postponed decisions till, till, till the end of the war, but how it, it will look like. And second question, you know, again, there are, if to look into Ukrainian side, of course, we can see three major players. Uh, government and Rada and, and President, all the, all the authorities, and, you know, then regional authorities, which again are very important, you know, players in the whole process, and of course civil society. But civil society again, uh, you know, some civil society role is very important on national level, but also you know another another point is you know civil society role on regional level. And in my you know I would very simple question: you know, how you see this interaction in between of national government, regional government, and of course, civil society, from where, you know, some kind of how this, you know, recovery plan should start to appear. What, you know, for example, when, again, I will, you know, name the same city, you know, Chernigov. When the Chernigov authorities will have, you know, request from whatever body, from national government, you know, or, or donors platform to start to prepare their own regional plans for recovery. And how you know that process will go on? So sorry for maybe, you know, a little bit too complicated question. But well, first, you know, calendar and then uh, some institutional arrangements. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yours is solid as from member yeah. of the European Parliament. Yeah. Thank Thank you very much indeed for for all for the pres your presentation. But I also would like to add to what Andrew said. We have a lot of uh, civil society initiatives, for example, in Lithuania to to support the, the Ukraine. And the coordination between the different initiatives. We have the some kind of also not only regional but also local, uh, local relation between the, the cities in, 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 for example, in Lithuania and in Ukraine. And how we can coordinate this whole initiative and to to create a synergy and get the the, 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 the better result if to compete sometimes in in, in this situation also. Thank you very much. Start your answer. Uh, 
thank you very much uh, for the, the many questions and the uh, excellent interventions uh, uh, that uh, I have uh, listened to. I took a lot of uh, notes indeed. Uh, well, uh, I wanted to uh, to start with, with the timeline, Mr. because Mr. Kubilius, you started with this question. We uh, are, of course, uh, trying to reply to where it's the most needed. We, uh, in the, the, the war is ongoing, the military needs uh, are there. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the priority for uh, European Union uh, member states to, to help in this, uh, in this respect, and also a priority to ensure that uh, uh, the vital role uh, of the state uh, continues to be ensured with the financing. And so the uh, fact that uh, we have been mobilizing our resources uh, for, for this purpose and to reply to the, as, as I said, to the uh, immediate needs for the population to go through the winter, uh, this is di dictated by the situation uh, in the country. So, which means that the timeline for a new instrument, uh, reconstruction, and this is, uh, at the moment, uh, we have to stick to the reality on the ground. It does not prevent uh, us collectively to think, to reflect, and to start uh, designing uh, how this should look like and uh, how we want to uh, uh, help uh, uh, Ukraine uh, in the uh, in the future. It's just that there is a bit of a dichotomy between uh, where we have to put our money now to help Ukraine and what should keep us intellectually busy to design for the next uh, uh, stages. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I wanted to mention that because I don't think that the fact that we did not come out with the uh, um, rebuild Ukraine facility as foreseen in May, it's not due to the fact that uh, uh, people uh, went uh, on for long leaves. This is not at all the case. Everybody has been so busy trying to make sure that whatever we bring is useful here and now in Ukraine. Uh, the, the second point that I wanted to, to make relates to the, uh, the role of the platform and the international community. Uh, in the EU, uh, we have a special role. Uh, Ukraine has been granted uh, the membership perspective. This was a historical choice which binds the EU and Ukraine for a long time. And this makes the uh, role of the EU in the reform process and in the reconstruction very special and not comparable to any other international partners. So what uh, the, the engagement with the civil society organizations that we have to have with the, uh, uh, the uh, that, that has to exist with the EU, uh, is something that we are keen and we are investing on it and we think it should uh, uh, further develop. But this is because of also we have a particular relation between the EU and Ukraine, which is not the same for any uh, other partners uh, of Ukraine. So what I want to say is that uh, the involvement of the civil society in the platform, so this is the decision of the steering committee uh, of the platform, uh, and. But irrespective of what they will decide, how it will look like in the future, uh, I think it's important for the Ukrainian civil society to understand that this is key to engage with the uh, Commission and with uh, other uh, EU uh, stakeholders because this is uh, uh, we, we 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 have this special uh, role uh, as the the partner uh, of Ukraine. Uh, now, related to the decentralization, role of local authorities, role of other actors. Uh, we believe that the reform uh, that has been implemented uh, for the decentralization in Ukraine has been a great success and actually one of the great success after the revolution of dignity that changed completely uh, the way uh, uh, the, the state operates, the role uh, of uh, uh, local authorities, obviously. And this is something that uh, we have been supporting uh, a lot and that we are continue to support. And so we uh, continue to pay a lot of attention to ensure that uh, there is uh, enough attention which is paid to the role of the uh, local levels uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, any policy and in particular when designing uh, uh, the future reconstruction. Uh, 
Uh, we have also to acknowledge that uh, it's not uh, uh, something which is uh, obvious, especially in time of war, where you have uh, to acknowledge that the, the, the magic middle between uh, bottom-up and top-down approach, uh, it's uh, something that should be carefully balanced and that indeed uh, there are some uh, 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 sectors, some strategies that should come from the national level and that would not come from the addition of uh, uh, local strategies. Uh, but indeed, uh, this is for the local communities to decide whether uh, the money that will be made available should be invested first in a hospital or in a school. This is a, so this is a, a, a balance that will have a, a, a to be found. Uh, we will always pay attention uh, to the involvement of local authorities, but ultimately this is for the for uh, Ukraine uh, also to define how it wants to uh, uh, arbitrate between these uh, 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 top-down and, and bottom-up approaches. Well, I'll stop here. For okay, thanks a lot. So uh, I would always looking to other you know speakers to intervene if you will see you know the need, but now we have uh, one. Uh, uh, one speaker who asked, uh, you know, from our audience to 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 have intervention, Natalia Forsuk, uh, head of the project Restoring Ukraine Together, uh, from the NGO Ants Group, with and and yeah, so we shall give the floor now to Natalia, who also wrote the question, but maybe it will be better for her to have the floor. Please, Natalia. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear. We do not see, but we hear. So no problem. Uh, sorry, uh, I don't go, know go why ahead. my camera my camera doesn't work. I try to okay, good. put it on, but nothing happens. Okay. Uh, so um, I have a in my previous experience, I have a combination of working for NGO, government, and also some business. And uh, my question is more related not only to the monitoring digital tool, which I support fully, and I think it's extremely important that we finally will have it, uh, but also to the project performance, because what we need to ensure that the money has spent uh, uh, in the result, we have a, a good project that meets the needs and it's not delayed in time and uh, everything uh, in the end leads to a quality infrastructure. And this mainly relates to good governance and other global practices, uh, which Ukraine is not really the source of, because we were uh, on the way struggling with implementation of big infrastructure projects and IFIs can obviously say that we are meeting a lot of challenges when we do infrastructure projects. So um, the things of importance is to pay attention to good governance. And my question was, uh, do you have any uh, ideas of how, uh, of how donor coordination platform will address this issue? And do you see any role of NGO to build up the capacity on the regional level? Uh, will there be any support for this on national level as well? And uh, do you think that uh, G7 countries or IFIs uh, who will be involved in this donor coordination platform will have a special uh, dialogue place, uh, site platform, let's say, to talk to NGO to collect best practices that could be uh, actually uh, analyzed and performed here in Ukraine? Because, as I said, the challenge that we have is very low capacity on institutional, legal, and governance level. Thank you very much. Yeah, so maybe we shall collect you know, questions uh, for all the speakers, because time is running very fast. I don't know how it happens, but when we are starting to talk about you know, very important issues, time is running. Uh, <laughs> okay, I see two, two, more, two more questions. Now I will read simply from uh, from uh, the chat. One question from Oleg uh, Savitsky. It's similar to what I was asking before. How multi-donor coordination platform will involve local governments into planning, delivery, and monitoring of projects? That's perhaps to uh, to Gabriel the question. And second is uh, is uh, from Victor Zagreba uh, from NGO Vision Zero. Uh, 
he is asking from our perspective in Brussels, to which degree are two following two things perceived by you and by us influential persons in Brussels, or all of us we are very influential, uh, are still valid and important, and why? Thank you. First thing, EU-Ukraine Association Agreement from 2014, or think second, the Lugano Conference and the Lugano Declaration. I don't know about that. Yeah, I see that Ambassador Mingarelli would like to, to speak. So, but let's put additional, yeah, three questions, and that's all. Okay, good. So, please. Yeah. Actually, I was asked to transmit the question of Zagreba, so it's already oh, done. Okay. Please, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Anton Antonko, Dixie Group um, think tank from Ukraine. And my question is, of course, to Mr. Blanc. And, um, I was thinking as you were talking about the calendar or thinking about the calendar that is it perhaps possible for whatever reason to include this track about still preparing the accession, accession negotiations into the work of your directorate? Since um, I fully understand what you say, the priority is, is very clear and we as Ukrainians feel it, I think, very much, so to say. But I think that as well, we on the ground and the government and civil society are able to push for proceeding the report, the, the reforms. And thus, our soldiers defend us and the rest of the Europe as well at the same time. So perhaps there is a chance that there might be a possibility of adding one more structure or one more unit to those you already have in the directorate that will not be only, only thinking, but also doing practical steps in the direction of the um, accession agreements. And my second quick point would be that perhaps that will also serve the reason to do in the green recovery. So that will be a format that will help to structure. We don't need ad hoc something newly made, right? That will be already the structure for the green recovery. Thank you very much. Okay, and the last point, yeah, please go on. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is uh, Andrei Kolyduk. I'm uh, ch founding chairman of Ukrainian venture capital private equity station from 2014. So we are the voice of those investors in the private sector. They've been investing and in the financing today, the NGOs and also the pro projects of the recovery. So my question to you about the, what is your view on the inclusion of the private sector, Ukrainian entrepreneurs, also being not only in Ukraine, but also in the Europe, because we have not only 5 million or more Ukrainian uh, temporarily uh, guests in the Europe, but also we have many entrepreneurs here, and how to get them equipped with the uh, equipment to actually help Ukrainian entrepreneurs in Ukraine to implement their projects that address essential needs of the people. And I refer to the water supply, energy, medical, housing, food production. Uh, which is possible in order to actually to address this today, because the for us the Marshall Plan started in 2014. This is why you see the all the IT sector now the very resilience by bringing cash into Ukraine, which finance the, all of these projects as of now. So how we can have this bridge between the Ukrainian and European entrepreneurs here, private sector behind, investors behind, by using the co-investment principles they've been doing from 2014. And how, obviously, to get the, our uh, uh, mother organization invest in Europe and also uh, European Investment uh, Fund and the bank as a part of this play now, not to the post war. Thank you so much. Okay, good. So we have plenty of questions uh, and quite limited time for 10 minutes because uh, we shall be kicked out from this room. And besides that, I will need to run again to another meeting and again on Ukraine. So that's the problem. Now, maybe we shall ask, first of all, Ambassador Mingarelli. I saw that he wanted yes, to jump yes. in. Yeah, very please go short, on. Very short, because you have many questions, and I will leave my uh, commission uh, colleague to answer. But uh, and Natalie put a question about uh, good governance and the lesson uh, learned. Uh, in any uh, reconstruction process, Natalie, you should have a team of monitors who analyze the implementation of each project during the life of the project, and you should have an independent team for the ex post evaluation. Once a project is completed, you should have people who analyze what has been done, 
the failures, the successes. And these two teams, the monitors and the ex post evaluators, should report on a constant basis to the Ukrainian governments and uh, the international uh, partners in the framework of the donor coordination uh, platform to ensure that we learn about our constant mistakes and we can improve what we do. Then there was a question, the last question about the role of the business community. I mentioned this in my short introduction. When it comes to the selection of the individual project, which is the second step, the first step is the choice of the priority sectors and the geographic areas we have to focus on each year. Once this has been done, you have to select the individual projects. And the choice of the individual project should be, as I said, in the hands of the local authorities, which mean the governors of the oblast and the mayors of the towns, of the business community, and of the civil society organization. They should not be observers. They should be the one who select the project for obvious reasons. I have no time to elaborate on that. And regarding the business community in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the EU, they should be involved in two ways in all this. First of all, they will be the contractors for a large number of projects. They will be the one who will be in charge of implementing the projects. And as soon as there is a, a ceasefire and hopefully a peace agreement, they will be, we hope, the investors. We hope that many, many European companies will understand what Ukraine represents as an investment space, as a consumer market, and as a stability pole on our eastern flank. Thank you. Excellent. And now, you know, Gabriel, again, voice to you. Time is running. Yes. Uh, th thank you very much. And thank you uh, um, for, for all these questions. So, uh, on the, the, the role of local authorities that I already mentioned, the importance of capacity building, this is something that, uh, that we acknowledge and we have actually uh, many projects uh, that are working with uh, networks of uh, Ukrainian cities uh, to help the, the, the capacity of the local administration. Uh, and I think this is something which is well acknowledged in the new setup that uh, has been put in place uh, in Ukraine uh, with, under the uh, Deputy Prime Minister Kubrakov and the agency uh, led by uh, Mustafa Naim, and that uh, uh, they have uh, really the intention to help where the local authorities do not have the capacity to handle uh, by themselves complex projects to provide uh, capacity to them upon request. So uh, we'll see how uh, it evolves and how practical it is. Uh, but this is a, a step which is, uh, uh, will be uh, certainly useful to involve the, the local authorities. Uh, on the, the, I just wanted to come back on the, the, the role of the, the private sector. And indeed, uh, as Ambassador Mingarelli uh, mentioned, that there are different ways of involving. Just wanted to say that we have what has been put in place already uh, in 2022, there are very important elements. Removal of tariffs. This, is, uh, this has uh, given uh, the possibility for uh, uh, Ukrainian exporters to export uh, uh, free uh, of any tariffs to, to the EU. And the solidarity lanes, so the border crossings between the EU and the uh, neighboring uh, member states to, uh, uh, because of the Russian blockade of the uh, uh, Black Sea ports. And that uh, allowed to have uh, a steady flow uh, of goods uh, still uh, traveling in and exported uh, uh, out of, uh, of Ukraine. Also an important mechanism. And with the civil protection mechanism, there is also possibility to collect uh, donations from private uh, companies to make sure that they, they will reach uh, uh, Ukraine. So that's more for the, the, the current part. And then indeed, and I think we, we have um, over the past few years developed a, a, a more uh, experience in dealing with financial instruments, uh, notably guarantees, uh, in view of uh, making uh, Ukraine an attractive de uh, destination for uh, uh, European investments. And uh, I think this is an area on which we will have to concentrate our effort. What are the right uh, uh, financial instruments uh, to uh, reduce uh, the risk perception of Ukraine and to make sure that uh, uh, investments from the EU uh, can happen uh, in Ukraine? 
Okay, so, and uh, Natalia and uh, uh, Valeria, short comments. Uh, maybe a very short uh, comment on uh, the involvement of uh, local uh, authorities into the process of uh, reconstruction. Uh, so I have very uh, good argument about it's, uh, why it's very important because we just held the public opinion poll asking people uh, inter alia about uh, uh, their uh, views, how they see the post-war recovery of Ukraine. And we asked about the principles of such uh, and recovery and reconstruction and we have uh, top uh, three uh, principles which are very important for uh, more than 40 percent of respondents so the first one is fight against corruption when using funds for reconstruction uh, the second uh, one is uh, building back uh, better and the third one is taking into account the opinion of communities and public so it's very good uh, argument, but it's very important to involve uh, local uh, communities and cities into the process. And also it uh, should be noted that there are different cities now and uh, different they have different needs. So uh, one which are destroyed, they need um, green uh, recovery. And also we have cities which are not destroyed or very minimal destroyed. So they need green transformation because we have uh, cities before the war which uh, had a lot of ambitions to become um, like pioneers in uh, climate neutrality, in decarbonizations like Vinica, for example. So now, now they uh, have uh, also some funding and some stimulus for, for, for their future development in, the, in line with a green a green transformation. Thank you. Okay, and Valeria? Yeah, you sh you have half a minute and half for me. <laughs> okay, um, just a few words about decentralization and the municipalities. Uh, yesterday we had a meeting with uh, Viola von Kraman and she said that because everyone sees how centralization of the power in Ukraine moves to the to the setback, the the decentralization reform it actually can have repercussions on public opinion in the leading European countries who support Ukraine, which I think that eventually we will come back on track with decentralization because there are already red flags, not only here in Brussels, but in, in, other, in other member states. That's, that, that's what gives me hope that we will, we will not lose the, the decentralization reform. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, that was, you know, I would call our first attempt really to start to understand how the uh, reconstruction process will go on on both sides, on the EU and in, in back in Ukraine. Definitely, you know, uh, I do not uh, have any kind of opinion polls, but while being in, in, in Kiev and in the regions, it's very clear that, you know, there is strong demand to start at least, you know, the beginning of reconstruction as soon as possible, even during the war. So calendar is, is, is here quite, quite, you know, rapid. And that is why I agree absolutely, you know, that is why to begin negotiations on EU accession is very important because not only from, you know, general political point of view, but simply because at least what I understand and what was with us, accession negotiations are bringing really very strong regular evaluation mechanism, which is still not the case, you know, with all only, only being, you know, uh, uh, not having, not having negotiations. So that is very important, and uh, it's important really to start negotiations during this year because next year, looking into a very simple political calendar, uh, elections in the European Parliament. So, you know, forget about big uh, decisions on our side. You know, <laughs> it's not a criticism to to yeah, but this is political logic. So, yeah. so that's why why really it's it's very important, and of course. Uh, Capacity building is, is absolutely you no know, priority. Our conclusion back from our early experience, you know, with Marshall Plan was very simple. There is lack of absorption capacity, or I mean institutional capacity on, on Ukrainian side, especially on the regions. We started then to, to move with some kind of you know programs with Canada and so on, but that is that is a real problem. And one of my colleagues who was working in Ukraine from Lithuania. He reminded me, I, I'm not so sure about that, but he reminded me the history of uh, original Marshall Plan. Americans took 
something like several thousand or even 10,000 European, you know, whatever, planners, bureaucrats, and so on for one year into the United States of America to show how to do the job. No, and that was real capacity building. So for commission, it should be also, you know, to bring Ukrainians somewhere, you know, to Brussels or somewhere else, and really to, to, to prepare them for a really big, big agenda. Sorry, yeah, sorry, I need to run. Thanks a lot, and uh, uh, we shall see on next meeting. Thank you very much.